this is not a typical message for me. And I'm afraid I might need my help this morning. And I'm just waiting for my help. This is one of the most right now words that God's ever given me concerning the state of the church. And I want us to understand this morning that as we refer to the church this morning, I'm referring to the church of America, the church at large. What this, what the Lord has declared this morning goes far beyond these walls. And actually, I believe we're one of the remnants that is an exception to what I'm about to preach. I believe this house is called to be a trumpet blower in this last hour. And if we cannot see the signs of the time and what's happening in the church, we cannot blow the trumpet. We cannot warn against something that we are unaware is upon us. I much prefer the happy, feel-good messages. But listen, when you're in line with what God wants and you're in line with scripture there's nothing more happier nothing more feel good than that when you're right with God so if you would turn with me this morning to the first chapter of Hosea the first chapter of Hosea we begin reading at verse 2 this morning I won't be any longer than I usually am, but I will preach the whole book of Hosea to you this morning. I challenge you to read it. It's only 14 chapters. It is an eye-opener. If you would turn, Isaiah chapter 1, beginning at verse 2, and it says, And when the Lord began to speak to Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take yourself a wife of harlotry, And children of harlotry, for the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. Let's pray, Jesus. Let us have eyes to see. Let us have ears to hear. Awaken your church. Awaken the church in Lincoln, Lord. I believe Lincoln, the churches in Lincoln are one of the worst offenders of sleepiness. Awaken the churches in Illinois. Awaken the churches of America. Lord, awake your church globally. Let us see what time we are living in. Let us know you. Let us know your word. And let us hear what the Spirit says to the church in Lincoln. Let me not speak one word that you would not have me speak. Let me speak every word you would have me to say. In the name of Jesus, the name above all names. Everybody said amen. In the realm of eschatology, the main go-to books of the Bible typically are Revelation, Daniel, and Ezekiel. But if you truly dig into the book of Hosea, I believe you would have to add this book 
to that list. The history of Israel, as described in the book of Hosea, can eerily be compared to the condition of the church in America. The title of today's message is The House of Harlots. In verse 2 of chapter 1, we see that the Lord tells Hosea to marry a harlot because the nation of Israel had committed whoredom. They had committed idolatry. They had turned their back on their relationship with the Lord. So in obedience to God, Hosea married a harlot named Gomer. We find, we never find one place where Hosea argued with the Lord. He was completely submissive to the will of God. I don't know about you, but I think my flesh would have had to argue with that. Go find a wife that will not be faithful to you. Go find a wife that has been with countless men. That's the situation that Hosea was facing. Don't ever tell anybody that God has asked too much of you. Don't ever say that because he is not. He is not. I don't see anyone who has been go went to go <laughs> ask to marry a harlot. Lord have mercy. There is evidence through the book of Hosea that Gomer was still active in her sin, even after her marriage to Hosea. If we read further, we see that Gomer has three children. In verse 3 it says, So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Deabam, and she conceived and bore him a son. Him meaning Hosea. Jump down to verse 6. And she conceived again and bore a daughter. Jump down to verse 8. And when she had winged lo Raham, she conceived and bore a son. Verses 6 and 8 make no reference to Hosea at all. It makes no reference to Hosea. These two children were offspring of other men. They were not even his children. Yet, he did not argue with God. He was completely obedient to the will of God. See, that's the biggest, one of the biggest problems with the church today is lack of obedience. The instructions for our walk with God is held within the leather cover of his book. But the problem is, is that half of the church has no idea what is in between these leather bound pages. They have no idea what this book says. Then you have the other half of the church. We think we are intellectually superior to this book. We think we have evolved. We think that through our own brilliant modern philosophy that we can pontificate an easy ecclesiastical exegesis that this book is no longer relevant. Oh, God didn't mean it that way. God didn't really mean that we have to live holy. God really didn't mean that homosexuality is a sin because that's in the Old Testament. We don't have to think that way now. We're evolved. One of the biggest preachers of my era a couple of weeks ago said that his thoughts concerning homosexuality were evolving. Can I tell you that God's thoughts have not evolved? He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if you're evolving, you're backsliding. God really didn't mean that because, see, the culture was different back then. We are enlightened now. Church, I'm telling you, it couldn't have been that much different because we're repeating the same sins and the same situations that Israel repeated 
back in the Old Testament. We're walking down the same path. You know, they say if you people that fail to know history will repeat history. Well, I'm here to tell you, if you don't know the word of God, you'll repeat the mistakes that are in the word of God that the people of God made. The same things that doomed Israel, the modern enlightened church is doing today. Today, pulpits are filled with preachers who will refuse to preach the whole truth of God. They are filled, filling the ears of their congregation with false doctrine that are leading millions, millions to hell. We see that it is no different than uh, Hosea's day. The temple was filled with priests who refuse to preach the truth. They refused. Look at Hosea verses uh, chapter 4, beginning at verse 6. Hosea chapter 4, beginning at verse 6. It says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. This is speaking of church people. This is an indictment on the church today. They are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I will also reject you from being priests for me. See, now he's directing towards the priest. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I will forget your children. The second half of this verse uh, condemns thousands of preachers across America this morning. Condemns them. Come on, somebody. I I know this is not popular. It's the truth. But what these preachers fail to understand is they're not only condemning themselves and their congregations, but they're condemning their very children, their very offspring. The last part of that verse says that God will forget their children. So for no other reason this morning, I have to stand here and preach truth because I have four children and I don't want God to forget who they are. I want God to remember my kids. I love you. Every single one of you. I love the church. But if you get mad because the truth is preached, I really don't care. I don't care. Take it up with the author of the book. Your approval matters to me. But if I have to choose between the approval of men and preaching truth, I will stand by myself with truth any day than with a crowd of thousands that are on their way to hell. I love my babies too much to trade their salvation for your approval. I've got to have truth. Too much of my world depends on truth. I've got to have the knowledge of God. I've got to have His truth. This church has been hated and mocked for truth and truth alone. Because in the end, the only thing that will be standing is truth. When the heavens are rent and God steps down and his feet touch the Mount of Olives and it splits open, you will either be on the side of truth or the side of a lie. Let us always stand for truth. Verse 6, it says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. It doesn't say destroyed because of enemies. Destroyed because of, I don't know, you name it. 
the lack of knowledge was their destruction. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also... See, it was a conscious decision. They rejected it. They weren't ignorant. They knew that knowledge was there, the knowledge of God. They rejected it. It says, I will also reject you from being priest for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I will forget your children. The more they increased, the more they sinned against me. I will change their glory into shame. Hello. Hello. Hello, America Church. Hello, Colosseums full of so-called Christians. You cannot tell me that Hosea is not a prophetic end-time book. The more America has increased in knowledge, power, prestige and riches the more shame we have bought on ourselves. we have bought the shame on us we have done this verse 8 says they eat up the sin of the people they set their hearts on their iniquity and it shall be like people like priest Wow. Like people, like priest. So I will punish them for their ways and reward them for their deeds. I'm telling you, church. This book that has been looked over by the majority of the church world maps out our destruction. It maps out our future. Why is the country in the shape it's in? Verse 9 lays the blame at the feet of preachers and the church. It's our fault. The church has become a house of harlots. We have cheated with God. We've cheated on Him. We once had a relationship with Him. And now we've turned our back for the first thing that could give us pleasure. We have become a house of harlots. But the pleasure is always short-lived. Look at verse 10. For they shall eat, but not have enough. They shall commit harlotry, but not increase. Because they have ceased Obeying the Lord. This is where we're at, church. I, I know this is, it's not fun. It's, it's, it's not the easy way. But this is where we're at. Hosea chapter 7, verse 13 says, Woe to them, for they had fled from me. Destruction to them. This is God talking. Destruction to them because they have transgressed against me. Though I redeemed them, yet they have spoken lies against me. Though I have redeemed them, yet they have spoken lies against me. This this clearly can be applied to the church today. People that were once redeemed. People that once... We're on fire with God. They don't speak the truth today. Churches, pastors, pastors that I have known for years. We saw on Facebook that that one pastor we have known for years, one of their praise and worship people putting on Facebook. They weren't living right. Clear as day. Proud of it. On Facebook. So Christ, Christina sent him a text message to the pastor's wife and said, not sure if you've seen this, but this is not right. Just, you know, they're representing your church. And, oh, honey, that's okay. No, 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 you don't understand. It's okay to do that now. 
She said, well, back when I knew you, 20 years ago it wasn't. Oh, it's, it's, it's different now. It's okay. It's okay. People that were once redeemed are no longer preaching. They're preaching lies. They're speaking lies against God. Hosea chapter 8 verse 7. They have sown the wind and reaped the whirlwind. The stalk has no bud. It shall never produce meal. If it should produce, strangers or enemies will swallow it up. History tells us that during the time, during this time that farmers would sow by taking seed and walking through their field and tossing the seed, conditions had to be just right because if a breeze or a wind came along, then the field would not be sowed properly. So what this verse is saying is that Israel took the precious seed of the word of God and carelessly tossed it into the wind of idolatry. Therefore, they have no spiritual harvest. But they would in turn reap the whirlwind of judgment. Can I tell you that if America, if the American church keeps sowing into the whirlwind of idolatry, we will have no harvest. Yes, there may be coliseums full of people, but the harvest will be how many people make it to heaven. That is the harvest. And when the trumpet sounds, who will be counted worthy to be caught up? Turn to the person next to you and say, I don't want to reap judgment. Tell them, good, you don't have to. You don't have to reap judgment. You don't have to fall into the same snare that Israel fell in. That We don't have to fall into that same snare. I know most of the church is in a terrible condition. But you can be a Hosea. You can be a Hosea. You can be a standard bearer of truth in this dark hour. You may lose some friends. You may not be popular. But in the end, you'll be standing. And people will be running to you because they know you have something they don't. You have truth. Despite all that Israel had done. Despite all the sin that they had committed. God still loved them. That's why he had Hosea marry a harlot. So the people, he could be a living example, breathing example of the love of God. Can you feel the heartbeat of God in this book? Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. It says, when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. Jump down to verse 3. I taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by their arms. But they did not know that I had healed them. I drew them with gentle cords, with bands of love. And I was to them as those who take the yoke from their neck. I stooped. And fed them. Do you hear the love of God? To these people. The heart of God is calling his people back. Saying I love you. The God of the universe is pouring out his heart. He is humbling himself down to pour out his heart. For his very creation that has turned against him. Jump down to verse 8. God's heart begins to break. How can I give you up, Ephraim? 
How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I make you like Ahmad? How can I set you like Zebeam? My heart churns within me. My sympathy is stirred. I will not execute the fearness of my anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim. For I am God and not a man. The Holy One in your midst. I will not come with terror. They shall walk after the Lord. He will roar like a lion. When he roars, then his son shall come trembling from the west. They shall come trembling like a bird from Egypt, like a dove from the land of Assyria. I will let them dwell in their houses, says the Lord. Can you see the blessing that we can walk in if we just follow the Lord? If we just be standard bearers of truth. My Lord Jesus, help your church. Help your church. Help us, Lord. We need revival. We need the power of God. There are several things I want us to focus on. As a believer living in a world which can so easily be distracting, we must always pursue holiness. Keeping watch over your heart is not an option. It's a necessity. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. So many problems that we're having in life, it's a heart problem. It's a heart problem. And if we would guard our heart and if we would keep our heart the way God wants us to, So many of these issues would not be an issue. Psalms chapter 51 verse 10 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right, steadfast spirit within me. This is your revelation for the day. Sin is dangerous. Sin is dangerous. Any type of sin is dangerous. It may seem harmless at the beginning, but in the end, it's destruction and separation from God. I have never seen a nation decline as fast as we have over the last 18 months. If you would have told me that it would have been this way, I would have had a hard time believing it. I'm not, I don't question this. I know this. I am certain of this fact. The time has come. That as a nation, we are entering a time in which the Lord has removed his hand. And he has allowed us and will allow us to face hardship and misery in response to our sin. I know this. It's not if. It's upon us. And at this point, there, I, I don't believe there's any reversing it. I don't. What we have to do now is we have to buckle up and pray for provision. We have to pray that the Lord will keep us in all things. We have to pray that the Lord will heal us, feed us. Protect us because I believe, listen, Israel was God's people. And if he, they did not, if the judgment did not get turned from his own people, who are we? Who are we in America to think that he will do it for us? Sodom and Gomorrah was judged and they had no scripture to go on. They had no Bible. They had no word of God. And they were judged because of their sin. And here we stand with the complete counsel of the word of God. And we think we're going to escape it. What is coming will be worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. Because we have rejected the truth. (laughs) 
Hosea chapter 5, verse 15. Highlight this scripture. Write it down. This is the Lord speaking. I will return again to my place till they acknowledge their offenses. I will return to my place until they acknowledge their sin, their offenses. Then they will seek my face. Oh, yes. In their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. That's where we're heading. That's where we're heading. Judgment is coming to America. And it's, it, it, it's God's last plea for salvation. That's what judgment is. It's to try to get his people to turn back to him. It's to try to get the, the, the people to turn and acknowledge God. He's doing this in order to draw us back to him. I believe we must prepare for what's coming. Judgment is coming to America. Judgment has to come. Despite what TV preachers tell you. Despite what you hear. Judgment has to come. Because if God does not judge America, he's not a just God. It's simple as that. And if there's anything God is, he's a God of justice. Because he's, if he's not a... See, justice... God holds justice in one hand and holiness in another hand. Because if he is not just, he's not faithful. And if God's not faithful, he's not holy. So he has to judge. Psalms 37, beginning at verse 27. Depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore. For the Lord loves justice. And does not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever. But the descendants of the wicked shall be cut off. So what verse 28 says. That if you are a lover of God. And a standard bearer of truth. That he will preserve you. During this time. He will preserve you. And he will preserve your descendants. But the descendants of the wicked. Shall be cut off. What should we do as we, as we enter this dark time? We must pursue God. Hosea chapter 6 verse 1 through 3 says, Come, let us return to the Lord. For he has torn, but he will heal. See, there's never a tearing without a healing. There's never judgment without grace. He has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two, now this, now, I believe this is very prophetic. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. I believe this scripture could be a reference to the rapture. It has been 2,000 years, 2,000 years since Jesus has walked this earth. The church has been active for 2,000 years. And it says, after two days, he will revive us. And on the third day, after 2,000, after after 1,000 years has passed, and after 2,000 years has passed, so 2,001, we're starting on the third day. This is the third day. You see what I'm saying? Somebody said, oh, we're still in the second day because it's 2015. No, we're, we're 15 years into the third day. This is the third day, church. A revival is coming and a revival is here. Because after the third day, it says, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. That sounds like the rapture to me. Second Peter verse 38 says that a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and as a thousand years is, is like one day. He goes on to say on the third day, he will raise us up. Just a thought. You might want to highlight that verse. After two days, he will raise us up on the third. Or, or, he will revive us on the third day. He will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Let us know. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning, and he will come to us like the rain. 
like the former and latter rain. That sounds like the last revival to me. The former and the latter rain. Verse 3 says that if we will pursue the knowledge of the Lord, he will come to us like the rain. Pastor Josh, I'm confused. You said a time of great trouble was coming and falling away and, and we should prepare. And now a revival. Yes, to both. To both. For the world, it's going to get very bad. Destruction is coming. For the church that is living in harlotry, it's going to get bad. And it's going to get worse for them because it, there's a scripture that says it would have been better that you not even known the truth than to depart from it. But for the church, for the ones that stand in truth and justice and righteousness, a revival has come and a revival will continue. A time of the greatest miracles that we have ever seen. You see, the next book after Hosea is the book of Joel. And in chapter 2, oddly enough, we, we, we jump down to verse 28 of the second book of Joel. But we completely gloss over verses 15 through 17. What does verses 15 through 17 say? Joel chapter 2. It says, blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation. Oh, sanctify. Oh, Jesus. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and the nursing babies. Let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and let the bride from her dressing room. Let the priest who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. See, Back in Hosea, we had priests that wouldn't preach anything. He's calling the priests to get in between the porch and the altar and say, spare your people, O God. Do not give your heritage to reproach that, they, that the nations should rule over them. Why should they say among these people, where is thy God? After we repent, after the true church calls on the Lord, after this body steps into our calling. Because this is what we're called to do. We're called to be a flame carrier for the kingdom of God. It says, verse 28, and it shall come to pass afterwards. No, no, it must. I'm going to do my pontificating. It must mean, see, this is not correct. See, this translate. It must mean that it shall come to pass before we pray, or at least while we're praying, you know, God can see we can get brownie points. God can see we're praying. No, 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 no. There's steps we must take. If we really want the power of God, there's steps we have to follow. After it shall come to pass after underline the word after. After you pray, after you blow the trumpet, after you repent, after you call a sacred assembly and consecrate yourself to the Lord, after that, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions and also on my men servants and on my maid servants will I pour out my spirit in those days and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. And here we are. This is exactly where we're at. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great an awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whosoever calls on the name of the, name of the Lord shall be saved. For in, the, in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance. And the Lord has said among the remnant who the Lord calls. The Lord's waiting on us. 
This is in our hands. He's waiting on us. Joel chapter 2, verse 28, will never come without verses 15 through 17. Will never come. If we repent, the Lord will show us much grace and love. When God directed Hosea to marry this unfaithful woman, he was calling a faithful prophet. A faithful prophet to be a, a living example. Although Gomer cheated on him, she broke covenant. She broke that relationship to go to the next thing. Look what Hosea said to her. And on this, I'm reading out of the NIV. Chapter 3 of Hosea, verses 1 through 3. And again, I'm reading out of the NIV. It says, the Lord said to me, go show your love to your wife again. Though she is loved by other men and is an adulteress, love her as the Lord loves the Israelites. Although they turn to other gods and love the sacrifice or love the the sacred raisin cakes. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a leaf of barley. He had to go buy her. He had to go buy her back. She left him and sold herself so far down the line. He had to go buy back his own wife. Verse 3, it says, then I took her. And this is Hosea talking. You are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any other man. And I will behave the same towards you. Hosea said, I know what you've done. But I love you anyways. The Lord is crying out. Not to, just to the world, but to the church. To the church. And he says... I know what you've done. I know what you've done. But I love you anyway. Come back to me. Come back. Church, he's calling you and me to be living examples of his love to this world. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 2 through 3 says, Ye are my, ye are our epistles written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifested, declared to be the epistles of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of God. Not, the ta- not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of heart, of the heart. That's you. That's you. Do you feel the weight this morning? You feel the weight of what God is calling us to do. It's simple, church. Stay faithful to God. And do what you have to do to get the knowledge of God. Get the knowledge of His Word. And have the good sense to obey it. Grace did not save Noah. Obedience did. Noah didn't go to the top of a high mountain and said, God, you told me to build an ark, but listen, grace, your grace is enough. Grace, grace, I'm just going to, you're going to cause a log to float by and I'm just going to get on it. No, he obeyed. He obeyed. And because he obeyed, he saved his family. And he saved the human race because he obeyed. Be a Hosea in this generation. The church as a whole may be a house of harlots. But this is a church with a Hosea anointing. And a a Hosea calling upon it to declare the truth of God. And to declare the love of God. I'll end with this scripture. Hosea chapter 14 verse 9. This is the last scripture. In the book of Hosea. It says, who is wise? Let him understand these things. 
who is prudent, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but the transgressor stumbles in them. Let's stand together. I know this message was hard. Believe me, it was, this was hard on me. This was hard on me. Messages like this take me, I'm just talking about me, take me three to four times longer to prepare than any other message. Because I, I have to go through and, and I'm, it cuts me. It tears me. And, and then I have to go through and I want to make sure that every word is no more and no less than what God says. Because one word less and I'm in disobedience. One word more, I've added to the word of God. And so in situations like this, I have to, you have, you have to know my heart. I have to be so cautious. This, this, it usually takes me two or three days to get a message. This took me weeks. Because I knew the Lord was serious. He's serious. See, I have to make sure it's God talking and not Josh stalking. See? Because I know preachers that could get up here and just rip upside down in the other and be completely okay with it and walk off and feel good about it. This doesn't make me feel good. This hurts. This hurts. But if we cut off some stuff, church, come on, if we cut off some stuff, we're going to be so much better. We're going to be so much more able to get in line with the will of God if we just cut off some things. Then Jesus comes to the surface when we start cutting off. Jesus can come to the surface. I want us to come this morning. And I, I, th- today, this is, this is for us to make sure we're right. Because before we can intercede for anybody else, we got to be right. I want us to come. And I, I, as she sings this holy visitation, we need a holy visitation. I want us to make sure that we are a Hosea. Pointing out sin, yet showing love to this world. Come on, if we can come, I know we usually don't kneel, but if you can kneel, if you physically can, we need to cry out to the Lord this morning.